So that's the case that we have here in 1983. And then, like I said, it's a cycle that happens uh, every so often, every several years. Another shell is coming on shore in 1987. You see where the shoreline was back here, you still see kind of the dark line between the vegetation and the, the sand beach. And now it's back here, look how far that beach has grown since that shoal is on my shore. And it happens all over South Carolina and um, these, these central and southern South Carolina coasts where we have a lot of inlets and a lot of short uh, barrier islands. Um, here's Fred Bobby, <coughs> same thing happening now. They've got a seawall on the sand, so you have a very queen uh, feature there, but same thing happening on a much smaller scale. Sandbar coming on shore, sand building up behind it, and then erosion on either side. Um, typically, the shoal bypasses, they're related to the size of the inlet. So if you have a small inlet, inlet there's small shoals and smaller changes associated with it. Well, we have one of the largest inlets with Stone Inlet in South Carolina, so you've got some of the largest changes. Here's just Another example of how that process works at Isle of Palms. So Moody's Inlet is a, a pretty decent size inlet. Um, the shoals break offshore. Here's the erosional <laughs> arcs on either side, so there's really no dry beach on either side of it. The shoreline actually built out to where it connected to the shoal. And then it took another couple of years for that shoal to get all the way on shore to rebuild that area naturally. And we refer to this process in three separate stages. Stage one is when the shoal just kind of forms offshore and you don't really see any shoreline change associated with it. Stage two is when the shoal is about right here. This is kind of late stage two. Um, the shoal is close to shore. It's causing the buildup behind it. You get your very focused erosion on either side of it. Once it fully attaches on the ends, then we say it's in stage three. And that's when the sand's spreading back out uh, and re nourishing the beach naturally. So like I said, stone inlet is one of the biggest inlets in the state, so you have much bigger changes than these uh, smaller events that we've seen. In 1998, here was the situation, this um, figure here. In 1989, the shoreline was back here, and there's a black line that's kind of hard to see here, but um, right through there was the 1989 shoreline. By 1998, a very large shoal had migrated on shore and wrapped around the very eastern end of the island. And it actually built the shoreline out 1,500 feet. Um, we'll refer to this area as the Eastern Lagoon because right now it's a vegetated, uh, basically it's a whole barrier island system. You have a sandy barrier, you have a marsh built lagoon, and then you go back to an upland area. So this can also be, be considered as a barrier island in itself, but it's actually just attached to the eastern end of Kilo, which is a very island. Um, and this has been ongoing uh, historically here at Kilo. Um, you had another shoal that was attaching just after the first one. We call the first one shoal one, the second one shoal two. In 1998, it was just kind of starting to reach the beach. This sand is building up behind it. Um, it's a large area here that will eventually be trapped. So in 2003, this is that same shoal. Uh, now the sand is starting to kind of work its way to the southwest, uh, kind of wrapping around uh, and trapping this area of water between it. This is what's going to be referred to as the Western Lagoon, as we kind of before. So in 2005, this is just before the project was done, this is the situation that we had. You have your Eastern Lagoon here, which is stabilized since 1998. It's infilled with sediment, which has created an elevation that can, uh, is conducive to marsh propagation. So now it's completely filled in with marsh, and it's got an incised channel. So there's one kind of main channel that goes through it that allows the flushing of the water to it. But here in the Western Lagoon, it was being fed by a flushing channel, and this is this one channel connected the whole system, both the Eastern Lagoon and the Western Lagoon, to the ocean. Uh, well, this flushing channel is being pushed in, it was being pushed landward, and it was being pushed to the south by all the sand. You know, this is creating a big bulge in the shoreline, which waves don't like. You know, waves like a big flat, uh, they like to flatten out everything. So the bulge is going to be highly erosional. So that sand is moving to the south, that's in that transport direction, and it's pushing that channel to the south. Well, there's the golf course right here. It's getting into the 18th hole and starting to cause some very serious problems for the driving range of the 18th hole. Uh, so the project was designed. Um, we kind of took out some of the project design steps because we've done this presentation several times before. But basically, the 
project was designed to relocate the flushing channel from over here where it was to this new location, uh, which was about right here. This is a recent aerial image from last October. Um, and to close it off, we were going to excavate material from the area near the flushing channel and also along the outer beach here uh, and deposit it and basically create a dike and create a beach going uh, down the distance from the, what's going to be the new clubhouse. This was a uh, the new clubhouse was being built. Uh, so the project was done in 2006. It moved about 550,000 cubic yards of sand, and that sand came from, he said, this area, which is behind where the new driving range is, and also came from the outer beach. Um, that sand was deposited along this area, so you see this big dry kind of bright area, that's all dry sand that's now been uh, dunes have grown up, it's vegetated, or you know, dune vegetation is growing. Uh, you have a, for a couple of years, this was a, a very productive bird uh, habitat, uh, and it's kind of just been evolving naturally since then. <laughs> Some changes that occurred, uh, here's um, another thing, this, this is the pre-existing condition in February 2006, just before the project. So we built the closure dike here, excavated some of those sand that's visible there, and also scraped the outer ridge. And a big part of this, we originally wanted to kind of realign the beach to what we thought it was going to become. Uh, we had this um, anticipated outcome. You see kind of the shape that we had it. Well, before, if you look at the current, this is kind of much more rounded shape. We knew that wasn't going to maintain itself. Um, so we were originally planning to build up a, the beach where we thought it was going to equivalent at. Um, but we talked with Fish and Wildlife and they wanted ma to maintain the piping flavor habitat, which um, they really preferred what's called wash over, which is an elevation of the beach that washes over during spring tides and storm events. So maybe once every two weeks or four weeks, once a month. It, it's kind of just an open sandy area that doesn't really get wet. Sometimes it, it does just enough to keep the vegetation down. That's a very transient habitat type. It's hard to keep them in place because of the way beaches work. It's just so dynamic that the, the habitats move a lot. Um, so they suggested, well, keep the elevations of that outer ridge <coughs> down low enough that you can maintain that washer <coughs> habitat. Uh, so we did that. We, we actually took some sand out of this area to allow that washer habitat to exist. If we would have built it up to a certain elevation, well, that would have just got higher with dunes and vegetation. By taking some of the sand out, uh, it allowed that to wash over every now and then. Um, so that was kind of the project. The channel was excavated here uh, at the very eastern end, and here's some pictures of that. Um, this was closing of the old channel. You kind of stockpile sand on either side of it, and then on very low tide, push it together to, and then build up as the tide comes up. And then we open the new channel on the other side. Um, over here. And that's just basically you dig a hole, and then when it's time to open it on the high tide, you break down the sills on either side, and that'll fall out of the flush naturally, and it'll kind of build itself as you do it. So this is looking just after the project, two months after the project. You see, this is the dike where the old channel came through right here, that green dotted line. Uh, we deposited a lot of sand here to offer protection to kind of restore the beach and to protect the um, site of the new clubhouse and driving range and to facilitate sand moving down coast. If we would have just built sand right through here and left this natural, which the shoreline was back here at that time, uh, then it would have left this susceptible to erosion because that sand would have been trying to make a more even profile. Like I said, they don't like sharp, you know, the waves don't like to deal with sharp edges, so by kind of making a smooth transition, um, it allowed the beach to kind of be more stable there. And you can see some of the excavated holes here. That's where sand was taken from this outer ridge uh, to use down here. And the new channel, is already, you can already see it kind of being pushed down around this way to the south. Okay, well now we'll get into kind of what's happened since then. Um, and we're, this, this is last year, of this, you know, the five years that were required to be monitored, so it's going to kind of sum up everything. We're not going to really go year to year or anything like that. We're going to kind of look at the big picture. Uh, 
Um, we broke down the area, or broke down the uh, beach into a couple of different reaches. And that, that allows us to look at kind of bigger picture, how the beach is doing over the <coughs> general areas. And starting here at this line, we call this the Ocean Course Reach, which is where most of our bill was placed and where that pipe was put. And then, like I said, we have that Western Lagoon, which is the new lagoon that was tracked uh, before the project. We have the Eastern Lagoon, uh, which would be all, um, that older lagoon that's filled with the marsh. And then the Stone Moon Inlet Reach, which is further around the island there. Down close to the project area, um, let's just say 2011, sorry. Down close to the project area, we have three reaches, the Turtle Point Reach, and these are our monitoring stations uh, in the orange triangles. We actually have lines every 400 feet in the project area. Uh, these are the old OC room stations that we monitor. Um, we have Turtle Point, West Beach, and Kiwas Bit. You can kind of see the limits of them there. Um, so a big event that happened in December or in 2007 was um, we originally built the question channel over here, um, but it actually naturally relocated. Um, further to the south here. Um, and that was kind of a function of leaving that out of berm and that washer over elevation. Anytime you have a dike, uh, which is kind of what that outer berm is, and you leave it low, it's going to be susceptible to erosion. And sand moving around to the corner, uh, you see how stretched out this channel is here. This, this is where the old channel was. It finally just became too inefficient to flush the water <coughs> naturally. Um, and this thin area here, just wasn't uh, built up enough to, man, or to protect that from scouring and creating a new channel. So there's a new channel formed here. It was a more efficient place for water to flush the channel or flush the lagoon system. Uh, didn't really have any implication or any negative implications. It was just a natural uh, process, and that was kind of a, associated with another show bypass event that um, we'll see in a minute. Um, we were monitoring it closely because if it started to move to the south too much, it would start eating into the dike and just uh, our problem would arise again like we had before. But fortunately it hasn't done that. Um, and so like I said, that channel relocated kind of in response to this next shoal, which in December 2006, uh, this is shortly after the project was done, there's already a emergent shoal visible. Um, it's migrating on shore. Uh, you know, right here, kind of off the apex of that western lagoon. And by May 2008, you can see how much the beach is built out behind it while well, it's also migrated uh, shore. So this sand came from this area where the flushing channel moved to. So you can see that that area had been eroding the sand and moving behind the shoal and that allowed that flushing channel to break through. And it was also coming through this area, which was contributing to that old channel and building. By April 2010, it was in stage three, that means it attached to the beach, you could see sands moving down the coast. So eventually that sand's gonna move all the way down and feed the southern end of the island. And in April of last year, um, it's completely attached. There's a little bit of a trap uh, water area that we're going here that the sand's built in. Um, and I'm not sure how well you can see in this lighting, but um, you can see how the marsh, where this is all basically open water and uh, sand flats, by 2010 and 2011, it's really become mostly vegetated marsh area. Uh, the channels have become more defined, you see less of that open sand flats. And one of the requirements of the project and what we were uh, tasked to do was to monitor habitat areas. Um, we established several different habitat areas that were uh, monitored, and we would do a uh, detailed survey, so every 400 feet we would have a survey and then we'd collect data points going all the way across from the back dune behind the lagoon area all the way out to the beach and then we would tie that in with our boats a couple of thousand feet offshore. Um, so these are the, mod the habitats that we selected and just here's kind of what those are. Uh, a is stable dune, um, so that's our typical stable dune habitat that you would see. B is washer, that's the critical one for birds. Um, it's somewhat hard to see but that. Uh, area here. Um, areas that are just below that stable dune line, but still don't really get wet much, that's the wash area. And then we have sheltered areas, sheltered intertidal, which are the areas that fall between the low water and the high water areas that are inside the lagoon. Sheltered subtidal, those are the ones that always have water in them inside the lagoon. Vegetated marsh, um, 
exposed intertidal, which is your active beach, if you want to on the beach, and the, that's the area between the high tide and the low tide on the beach, and the exposed subtidal, which is half the ocean. And so what we did was we had this polygon that we created, and we were going to map, monitor all the habitats within that fixed boundary. And that gave us one number for a total acreage, which was I think was 636 acres. And the different colors correspond to the different habitats. And so we have these for every single year. Um, and we, I'm just showing the pre and the current uh, habitat configuration. So the pre, we had a channel that came through with uh, lots of this sheltered intertidal area, which was your um, <coughs> sand flats in that area. This is the only vegetated marsh uh, in that dark green color. And these are the sheltered subtitled blue. And the orange is the wash area. That's what we were trying to maintain for long. So this is October 2011. Skipping all the intermittent years, um, <clears throat> the biggest changes you see are the stable dune area that's uh, created in front of the Ocean Course Club house. So that's protecting the house and the golf course. So we're not having to work on another project in the near future, um, hopefully anytime. Uh, the orange and the wash over. Um, some is developed naturally here and then out here associated with the project. All that is what we consider wash over habitat. And then all the vegetated marsh you see in the green color there. There's still a good bit of sheltered intertidal area and not near as much sheltered subtidal. So there's not much deep water. And that's because every tide that comes in is bringing sediment into the system. That sediment then gets deposited. So it's naturally building an elevation and filling in those lower areas. So we expect to see less and less subtidal area and more and more intertidal and eventually vegetative marsh habitat. Um, and that's all dependent on how stable this outer firm is. If it migrates landward because there's not enough sediment to keep it built out seaward, then it will erode into the marsh, overwash into the marsh, and it will all kind of just push landward. Um, but right now we're still having enough shoal bypassing events that's maintaining this out here, just like this eastern lagoon uh, has been maintained several hundred thousand or fifteen hundred feet seaward of where it was in nineteen right now. And here's the actual values um, for from year to year. And I don't need to go into a whole lot of detail on that, but the, the biggest you know one of concern is the wash over. You see how it's increased from uh, about forty six to about eighty cubic yards. So our eighty uh, areas at eight acres, eight acres. So it's about a 75% increase from the pre-project condition and wash over habitat. Uh, vegetated marsh has really grown a lot from about 20 acres to over 50 acres. Um, the sheltered intertidal, like I mentioned, it has decreased and that's been because it's transitioned into vegetated marsh. It's all a transition and at some point it's going to reach an equilibrium like the eastern marsh. So this is kind of the kind of wrapping up the habitat side of it. Again, in December 2007, not too long after the project, the new channel is opened over here. The old channels just closed off and started to kind of fill in that area. Only a very limited marsh area. This, this on the back side, a little bit here. In April 2011, all that dark areas, vegetated marsh, and just a few channels to kind of feed the system and water moving or sand moving down the coast. Um, this channel has maintained itself over the last year. Yes. Uh, are these taken at the same uh, tidal time? We try to do all these at low tide. So they are low tide, but whether it's the low tide is as low as it was you know, one day from the next or one year from the next. Um, but generally, yes, they're all you know, at low tide. There's actually a new channel that's opened up in there. In the last, probably from November to today, I'd say it was February, March time period. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the original opening, which was the one that was closed, mm -hmm. was reopened back up. Really? And there's a second channel going in. If you go. So down kind of this way? Uh, no, it's actually up uh, closer to the golf course. Oh. Uh, right about where the old channel was. Uh, <clears throat> the one that's further down is now what appears to be closing 
close of that, and it's opened up a new one closer to the ocean portion. Well, I, I've talked with Jim, and he said they come and go. Um, but what, what happens is, and what we saw as of October 2011, using those images, is there's kind of a channel throat that, that maintains itself, but once you get past that throat and out onto the active beach, sand moving causes it to meander down south, and it will meander far enough that it will eventually become inefficient and cut a new one, and then that will meander. And you can actually see, I think I have an image of it. Um, well, that new one eventually blows up. But it's, it's got it'll, it Yeah, it, it'll eventually work its way south, it'll close off, and it'll kind of start itself back over to the north. Um, and when we were out doing our survey, we could actually see elements of three channels. So it was the current one, and then there's two kind of swales that you can see where the old ones were. So it's a very you know, dynamic system that you go out from one week to the next and it'll change, but that throat section, which is what we were more concerned with, uh, really didn't move at all between October 2010 and October 2011. Yeah, I'd say I've been going out there for five years. I've, I've never seen as much of dramatic change in the last six months as I did the previous six years. Okay. It's, it really, it's pushing a lot of sand into, into the West Lagoon. In fact, it's almost scraped it, you know, subflat anymore in that new uh, inlet, which was probably about 20 feet wide, is now probably three times larger than that in the last four months. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it's big, it's, it's a big difference. So basically, to, to sum up what um, big picture has happened as far as the, the physical structure of the Eastern end. Was, in reality, we've created a three mile long, naturally, not we created, but um, the three mile long barrier island Lagoon system is formed via these two shell bypass events. If you, you know, walk from one end of it at the uh, clubhouse there all the way around to the eastern side of the east the game, it's about three miles long. Um, 400, or 400 acres of you know, dune, washover marsh, and uh, shelf and tile habitat have been created naturally. And it's added about 5 million cubic yards of sand to Key Island in that time. Uh, so wash area areas have been preserved. Uh, so like I said, that channel is so around. And just to give you an idea, NAXA just did a um, regression project that was about 4.6 million cubic yards. And that was about $32 million worth of work. So that's in general about how much value-wise it would cost to put that sand on the beach. There's a, um, when the channel uh, opened originally, mm -hmm. there was, uh, there were two uh, freshwater lakes uh, alongside uh, holes nine and, and eight. Right, that's kind of back in here. Yes. Yeah. And uh, when, it, when, it, when it opened, it, it opened that, portion two and drained those two and made them saltwater mm -hmm. uh, tidal ponds. Um, that channel seems to have gotten smaller and smaller and uh, do you anticipate that it eventually will close and go back to being freshwater? Yeah, I'm familiar with what you're talking about. And, uh, they tried to close it about three times and it was never enough. Yeah, I, I don't anticipate it closing naturally by itself. Um, I think it will be possible to close it, but you have to maintain it. Um, well, it was there naturally for years and years and years and years. Yeah. The freshwater or the? The freshwater. Yeah, once that, that channel kind of butted right up against it, those very thin layer of land separating the old channel with those lakes and um, I guess yeah, I don't know if that happened before the project or right around that same time, but before. It, it was just before the yeah. Yeah, it once that opened couldn't. up and it became soil. But we were in there a number of times and pushed the bulldozer, closed it off. The next morning we opened it. So it was you know it was a hopeless uh, endeavor. It, it had to be sufficient enough to cover the, the tidal pipe plus 
water was percolating through underneath, and that caused it to erode quickly. Yeah, that's, that's kind of why that boundary of our study, so we haven't really looked at um, any of that. But uh, this, kind of moving on, how these show events impact the down coast into Kiowa is, it's not necessarily just a net trickle of sand coming down evenly from the island. Sometimes you get these pulses, so as the you, know, you get an erosional water because it's shoals in stage two, but once it reaches stage three, then all that sand is available to move down coast. So we have observed pulses of sand moving down coast associated with shoal bypass events. And if you look at just a net volume change on the island, if you have um, three profiles here across the, across the beach from north to south, A, B, and C, first you would see a big increase in sand today. And then sometime after that, moving through time, at time, say time two, you get an increase in sand here at D, and then further uh, along in time, you see that pulse kind of hit C. So it, it's kind of blocks of sand moving down the beach. And then you do have some just kind of long-term net accretion general here as uh, well. So now looking at the unit volume, so this is your beach condition, how much sand is in your beach profile. And we use a unit called cubic yard per foot. So if you're standing at the beach looking out at the ocean and take a one foot width of beach, that's how much sand is in that one foot width of beach from where you're standing at the dune down to a certain contour. So going all the way offshore, we almost moved it to a certain contour. And here we use about minus 10 feet in ABD, and that's about minus 10 feet below, or 10 feet below sea level. So that's you know, well over your head when you're uh, waiting offshore shade a couple of profiles and might better explain it. But, um, here are our monitoring reaches. Uh, Key West Bit was featured for point that's down coast of the project area. Ocean course, uh, that's going between the dike um, and that the recreational facility there, station zero that's kind of boundary of that. Um, and the relative volumes should be comparable. The reason why these are so high in the Western Lagoon is because that's associated with the delta. That's where all that sand is in the low tide area and the shallow water, underwater area. Uh, so to get to minus 10 feet, you have to go a lot further offshore. So you have a lot higher volume of sand in that region. Here along Stone <coughs> uh, the channel kind of truncates the beach and it's a very steep profile when you get underwater, so you don't have to go as far offshore to get that minus 10 feet. So that's the reason you have kind of big differences between one reach and the next. Um, Key West Beach Spit's also higher because it's associated with the uh, Captain Sands Inlet Delta. Um, but basically what you can notice between uh, the earlier surveys of 2006 when we had the data formed in 2007 um, is there's generally been an e increase in all the reaches except for the Western Lagoon Reach. Um, the increases aren't very dramatic uh, and that just shows kind of a net long-term slow net accretion event going on. Uh, but here's the, the big changes. Um, over the past year, the east end has lost 107,000 cubic yards, and all that loss was associated with loss in the western lagoon area. Um, and that's as sands uh, being overtopped and pushed in and then moving down coast. Uh, it's also erosion of that last show bypass event that attached to the Western Lagoon, that sand being eroded away. Um, so we're seeing a good bit of erosion, but we're still at more sand than we were in 2007. Um, island wide, we lost 136,000, 137,000. So about 30,000 yards was lost from the down coast reaches over the past year. Uh, and when you think about the distance there, that's really not very, that's not a lot. That's basically stable. And most of that was actually lost here to keep us fit reach. You can look at the, the difference reach by reach on the actual set of loss. Um, 1,600 cubic yards over uh, the length of West Beach is basically nothing that's stable. Same thing for 4,000 cubic yards. That's a very low, that's 0.03 cubic yards per foot over that time period. Uh, the ocean course reach actually gained sand, so that's the area along the whole 16, 17, 18 the clubhouse. It's getting sand in the Midwest is uh, eroded a lot. The Lagoon East, the eastern one has been very stable. We still don't know that it's at the road. Now, the 
and that changed since 2006 uh, or 2007 in these three reaches with the throwing data. Uh, we've shown a net gain of about 785,000 cubic yards over the whole island. So without you know, any kind of artificial uh, inputs of sand, you've gained 785,000 yards. <coughs> Most of that was gained. Is that net of the 136? Or? The 136 was the total loss over the whole island. But <coughs> so that, that 785 includes losing that okay. 136, 137. <coughs> so even with the past year's erosion, we're still well ahead of where we were a couple years ago. <coughs> um, forgive me for having this slide with a bunch of lines on it, but um, this is, if you looked at it, uh, this area, or the, the left side, is basically the Key West Bit, Captain Sam's Inlet, and then moving to the east, um, this would be the eastern boundary of the Turtle Point Beach, moving into the Ocean Course area when you go off the side. And all I really want to show you here is this red line is the 1999 condition, and then the black line is the 2011 condition. So at every station, except for this one right here, which might be anomalous, Data have to you know work with the data as best we can. Sometimes we get single profiles that kind of do well. But basically, in general, we're much better off now than we were in 1999. Um, at the Kiowa Spit, we're actually close to 100 cubic yards per foot more sand than was there in 1999. Um, if you look at the difference between the black and the yellow, which is very hard to see, that's the change from last year to this year, or from October 2010 to 2011. And you know, when the black line is below the yellow, that's when we've lost sand. We've lost a little bit of the key walk that reached um, at the eastern end of the Turtle Point Reach. We've lost some sand in the past year. At the western end of the Turtle Point Reach, we gained sand. So there's a net, not a very little change in the Turtle Point Reach. Uh, but West Beach was fairly consistent, fairly minor um, changes there. But the big picture here is if you look at the red line and the black line, as long as the black bombs put the red line, we're better off than we were in 1999. So that's all stations except for this one and this some data that um, So looking in a little bit more detail at the Turtle Point Reach, we said that this lost about 4,000 yards over the last year. Um, that's 0.3 cubic yards per foot. Uh, yeah. There's a question back on the previous slide. If we had the thumb reverse, would the net gross number Right. Since we, we didn't add any sand, we didn't take any sand away, so the net sand change would be the same now. Whether that's in what reach, those numbers would have changed because it would have it, it would have taken longer for that system to equilibrate and reach the stage where it's feeding the down coast side. Right now, you're getting a lot of sand moving down coast. It would have taken a couple more years before that would. Have so the net is a bit about the same. Mm -hmm. And if, if we are creating net over time, and we don't go any closer to the ocean over the time, then we've got a good chance of nature kind of taking care of it. Unless, uh, you know, unless something changes as far as the recent, you know, recent being the past 100 years history of work of erosion, you know, unless there's some event that changes that pattern, then yeah, you'll be very well off. Mm -hmm. Could you just go back one more slide? I want just a clarification to make sure. That when you say east end total there at the bottom, is that referring to just the east reach? Remember you divided it into five reaches? That, yeah, east end I'm considering the project area, which are these four basically areas. Um, Stalin actually wasn't a project area, but um, if you drew a line here, that, that would be considered the east end. Okay, so from ocean course going to the right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, this is the correct interpretation then. 645,000 of the 784 net accretion occurred in that one reach, is that right? It's occurred between the ocean course and the stone and the Correct, side. that one reach. So the down coast side is only, uh, well, it's about 140,000 cubic yards. Got it's it. gained. Thanks. Uh, and I'll. Um, if you look at those three reaches since 1999, they've gained about 1.4 million cubic yards down those reaches. So Turtle Point West Beach and Key West Bay. Maybe it's worth just reiterating that that 645,000 yards gained is since 
September of six, which was after the project. <coughs> so this is a, above and beyond the five million cubic yards that were gained prior to the project. So. So the, this is the total point reach again since 2007. It's shown a gain of about 45,000 cubic yards, which is 3.3 cubic yards per foot, uh, which is pretty close to the historical average for the island. Um, this is looking at a cross section of the beach. So this area will be the dune. Down to zero is your kind of active beach area. And then when you get into this area between about minus 3 and minus 10, that's the underwater portion of the profile where sand's still moving around, but we don't see it. And it's important to do surveys down to there um, because if you don't, you miss some of the volume associated with bars. And that was a big thing with this past survey, it's something we haven't seen in the past five years, uh, was that the southern end of the island had a pretty significant bar feature. Um, and that's this bump in the black line that's offshore. It's only about minus seven feet, minus 10 feet. Uh, and that was present in most all the profiles. So if we only surveyed down to minus five, which is about where you can walk out at low tide with a survey rod and not soak your instruments, um, you see a, a net deficit, sand deficit, you see a long loss, because that sand from the upper beach has moved offshore. By, move, by surveying down that far, you said, okay, well this volume, if you add up the loss here and then here, that's your actual volume change. Um, so we saw a net loss in the air profile, but then we saw a net gain if you go all the way down. <coughs> And that's where the surveys start to overlap. There's not a lot of sand. Uh, they're, they're, that's not saying that there's no sand moving from offshore to offshore, but it's not a significant amount to uh, affect the beach. Stay there, just stay there for a moment. I want to point out a little factoid that some of you may not be aware of. Where are the biggest dunes on Kiowa? Turtle Point or the Ocean Course, West Beach, uh, West. Flyway Drive? Where, where do you see the highest things? Well, it's usually around West Beach Village, right? Okay, you get high dunes for one, one reason. This shoreline has to be stable for a period of time so that one dune keeps getting fed with sand. If the beach accretes very rapidly, as it has way out by the ocean course, what happens is you have a new dune line forming while the old dune line is becoming vegetated and stabilized. So all the sand is collecting in the new dune line, and then in a new dune line, and so on. So you end up with these low rolling dunes, like you have out by Flyway Drive, which from a storm protection standpoint is not quite as good as the all down on Eugenia Avenue who have higher dunes. You know, you're a little bit closer to the beach, but you've got these big dunes in front of you. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. So if you ever see a lot of low rolling dunes as you see on the east end, that means you're gaining sand, but you're gaining it so quickly that the dunes don't have time to grow up before they become vegetated and stabilized. Okay. How do you do those, uh, those profiles? <laughs> I can see how you might do it out to about five feet, but how do you get to 10? By, by boat and GPS, it's all linked together. And in the old days, it was a real hassle and it was very inaccurate. Today, it's uh, easier, more accurate, not necessarily foolproof, but it's, it's a lot more. Are there also uh, aircraft altimeter surveys that, that you all have access to? That you, you can, use? but, but to you penetrate know. underwater, oh, yeah. but we don't. The, the turbidity in the water is too high here in South Carolina. Uh, you can do that in very clear water. You get a, Underwater surveys that way. Or the dry land part of the beach, is there a Yes, you can do LIDAR. Are those done every year? Why? USGS does some, but not every year. Um, they're more like every four or five years. Um, I think the latest one that they have available for a lot of the, the South Carolina coast is 2007. The spots have somewhat newer data. Um, Supergon just did a LIDAR survey by Topo. I think the cost was about thirty thousand for that. So just just for the lidar imagery before you do any processing and analysis. So, so it's a little bit more expensive. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, Tim. Uh, Folly Beach is, is 
planning a beach being nourishment. What? Yeah, I think you're working on that, is that right? Well, that's a federal project. Yeah. And uh, we're doing some work on the park. On the park. Colony Beach County Park, right. Um, How, what effect might that have on us? Anything? That generally it has not in the past. 20 right? or 30 years from now, it will have a positive impact. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, that little handout in the back there, we talk about the sand movement around it, and we do mention how sand gets from Folly Beach to Kiowa. Okay, and you'll see it takes a very circuitous path, and it, it takes a while to make that path. Um, so, yeah, you can just read, read that in, in the back there. But the short answer is, decades from now, it will be a benefit. But, you know, a lot of us are going to be gone by the time it's... Yeah. Yeah. Are they going to have funding for that, that work? Or when are they going to have funding? They say it's... 2013, they were talking about it. 2014, probably. Is that what you're talking about? Federal and Sandlin? Are you federal and Sandlin? Yes, that's federal. Federal. Okay. That's just speaking about sand on the beach. What about at groins? Well, Folly Beach has a whole field of groins. If a terminal groin is built at the park, that will have the effect of trapping about 50 to 100,000 cubic yards of sand. Remember, you've just gotten 750,000 yards off the inlet. Prior to that, you got 5 million yards off the inlet. So the impact of the groin at any groin at Folly Beach will be proximal to the immediate area around the groin. Right so it will spill up, fill up in the groin and then spill out over the right. Yeah. And, and the, they were built up while it was constructed so it would already meet that 100,000 yards. So it wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't lose 100,000 yards while that thing was going to fill up. It's really, to, to keep this in perspective, the quantity of sand in the stone aluminum has been measured at about 120 million cubic yards. And Folly Beach growing may trap 100,000 cubic yards. So what is that, 0.01% or something like that? So, uh, where is that sand coming from? I assume it's inland sand being carried by the stone mold from the creeks and so forth. You mean the sand, the the sand in stone? The sand in the song. That's been there for centuries. It's really just being recycled around. All of our ebb tidal deltas tend to have sand that's been in place during the Holocene period, Holocene being the last several thousand years. So the thing that makes Kiowa, Seabrook, Isle Palms stable Two factors. One is we have large tidal deltas with huge volumes of sand. And the second is that our inlets tend to be ebb dominant. So that means when the sand is dropped in the channel, it will tend to be flushed offshore and reside in that ocean delta. See, if you go up to North Carolina, they have open lagoons, and many of those inlets are flood dominant or a storm comes along and pushes sand into the lagoon because the lagoon <coughs> hasn't filled up. So you are losing sand up in North Carolina to the lagoon, and it's permanently lost with respect to the beach. Whereas here in South Carolina, we lose our sand to ebb tidal deltas, but the ebb tidal deltas can only grow so big until they start to get unstable. And then what happens? It comes back on shore. So some of that sand that's recycling around the east end of Kiowa, and going the other way, going towards Stonewood, is going to fall in the inlet. It's going to come around the corner, get up to almost Bass Creek. Fall, is it Bass Creek? Yeah, Bass Creek. Fall in, and then it'll get flushed back out, hang out in those shoals for a while, and then it'll come back in. So that's, that's the good news for, for our place. Sorry. <laughs> Back to the west end, the, um, the spit appears to be growing, and is that growing based on sand that's being washed down from the east end? Yeah, it starts at the east end, it'll work its way all the way down the island and go west end. And I said that we've lost version of Kiwa spit over the past year. Our last station is a couple thousand feet from the end of the spit. So while we've shown that loss within our station, we don't go all the way down the end, which we assume
kind of just getting sand because the inlet continues to migrate towards the seabrook and that's sand that spills up. So that's one note that may be It starts at the east end and works its way south. And you know, the, there's a there's always a north to south sand, uh, what do they call it, sand wave, uh, sand. river of sand that you hear about referred to in South Carolina. That's not always the case. In summer, if you have waves from the south, well, sand's going to move to the north. You go down to Edisto Beach, and if you go, or probably Poly Beach too, if you go look at the end of the groin cells, go one week, the sand's pushed up to one side of the groin cell. You go, you know, later in the week, usually maybe in the winters, or you know, later in the year, it's on the other side of the cells. It moves back and forth. But the Kiowa, it's a long-term net transport to the south. So you know, day to day, it might change, but if you average it all out, it's to the south being the we're about to wrap up. Uh, if you look at the West Beach Reach, it was basically stable over the past year, but since 2007, it's gained about 35,000 cubic yards, which is about three cubic yards per foot. And um, it's a Kiowa Spit Reach, well, it walks 27,000 yards. And you see where our last station was here, so you have all this area there to the spit that could have gained sand. Um, it's shown a neck name of about 95,000 cubic yards, or 16.7 but just kind of a general idea, if you're less than two or three cubic yards per foot, that's kind of stable, very minor change. If you're between, say, three and ten, that's pretty moderate uh, you know, erosion or accretion. Once you're above ten, that's pretty significant erosion or accretion from you know, one piece to the next. So if you look at uh, this station in the Kiowa Spit, um, back here in 94 in the red line, and then 99 in the blue line, uh, we've shown about 150 feet of growth seaward in that profile. We also have a big bar that's up in this past year. But if you look at the um, Eugenia Beach access, it's been <coughs> um, fairly stable. Not, you get a little bit of seaward growth here, but not much. And that's why you have those big things. It's a very low uh, net accretion rate. If you had a low net erosion rate, you might still have a high boom from past accretion, but it would be scarping during storms. And Right now, you might have a little bit of scarping in that area, but it's usually right there at the base of the dune. It's maybe you know, 12 inches, 18 inches high, and it's not really significant to heal itself. So, in summary, uh, all regions except for the East Lagoon show net gains since 2006 and 2007. The East Lagoon shows a net loss. That's that uh, older lagoon system, and it's um, lost sand to the West Lagoon and also lost sand to uh, the uh, Stone Limit. Overall, the island's gained 785,000 cubic yards since 2006 and 2007. And if you um, look at just the Dalcoast area, like I said, it's about 1.4 million cubic yards per foot since 1999, which is about a 3.5 cubic yard per foot per year accretion rate. Wash area area, that's the one that we're most concerned with. It's actually increased since the project, and that's being maintained. It's those, these new shoals are creating and destroying that habitat. Um, right now, if you go out to the very east end, uh, kind of a southern bulge of the east end, there's some dunes forming, vegetated dunes. Well, those will likely be eroded at some point over the next three or four years, and that'll be washed over habitat, and then dunes might grow in some other areas. So it's still going to be dynamic uh, as those shoals are coming on shore. Uh, we have about 37 new acres of marsh, vegetated marsh area in that western lagoon, and then we have a next shoal is currently out there now. It's not emerged, so you don't see sand, but you do see breaking waves out there, and it's about 2,200 feet from the beach as of October 2011. So we expect in the next four to five years, that's really going to, that's going to migrate towards the beach, and in about four or five years, you'll see the, uh, that become merging with the beach. I know there's consideration of recutting the inlet at Jackson mm -hmm. If that's done, what effect, if any, would that have on all the sand that's accreted there? The, well, it's been done twice before. It was done in the early 80s and it was done again in 1996. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to the picture of the spit. Feet from where it is now, that's 
that's that same location. And then very quickly after that, uh, it'll just start to rebuild and start moving back south again. So it, it's not going to have any impact north of where it's going to be cut. If I understood you correctly, you said that if the sand was migrating to a seabird. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to the inlet. So I'm not sure why would the recut of the inlet be necessary if the sand's going towards the seabird anyway. Because the channel is truncating the seabird. It's actually a cutting line. So you have the channel cutting in and imagine that this is the south end of the pier. This is the spit. You have a delta here. The channel is migrating into Seabrook, so it's, it's shortening Seabrook. Much like what's happening with the ocean course and that channel from the flushing channel here, that was moving south, eating into the beach at the ocean course. The same thing's happening on a larger scale with Captain Sands and it's actually eating into the island and it's interrupting the sand flow because the sand has got to go out to the delta. Then it starts interacting with the delta of the Dennisto River and it causes problems for their sand flow around there. It's, it's somewhat related, but uh, it's our process. Yeah, just go back to that other one in a moment, because I think this will answer, answer the question. Uh, this delta here acts to trap sand and back it up against the spit. So, uh, Captain Sam's Inlet, if it's moved about 3,000 feet to the north, not all the way to Beach Walker Park, it'll still be a good 4,000 feet from Beach Walker Park. But it'll form a new ebb tidal delta, which will act as an underwater headland. And that will back up sand along the spit here. So it actually, we've seen in the past years, it's had a positive effect on Beach Walker Park, Westview Beach Village, that whole area in there, because it, it pushes the delta up closer to Kiowa. So it's good for both islands. And then, you know, immediate term. And then that would be a bad management choice for you guys if it weren't for one simple fact. You got so much sand at the other end of the island, it's working its way down. So it's replacing. And that's that's why the monitoring is so critical. It's attracted those packages of sand. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, Tim, this is your uh, this is your fifth report that was required after we did the beach. How often do you think we need to do what I would call the cross-sectioning and the monitoring? About, in my mind, probably every five years, something like that? Well, you know, again, that's, that's sort of up to you. I mean, unless we have a storm. I mean, if we're just, you know, we're going on, we don't have any big hurricanes, and the beach, is, you know, officially appears to be accreting or holding its own, I guess my question is, how long, you know, how often do we need to have you guys do what I would call a technical evaluation of the beach, you know? Well, we can be self-serving. I know. understand. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I really think there is at least value in, in this kind of information because it does tell you where you are. It's sort of an annual checkup on the conditions here. And, you know, to put, put things in context, the, the cost of monitoring of several tens of thousands of dollars a year versus what is the cost of buying 5 million cubic yards of sand or buying 785,000 cubic yards. You know, the communities like Myrtle Beach and others, Max Head, that are buying all this sand and are shelling out you know, just huge amounts. I remember back in the 90s, we had a lot of debates about what was going on because some of the folks at Eugenia Avenue were experiencing erosion. Right. And we think that what was happening at that time is that there was all this sand being bottled up and coming into the east end. And at the same time, sand had been building up in North Edison, that it was allowing a broad erosional arc to form between the east end of Kiowa and Seabrook Island, North Edison Inlet, and Eugenia Avenue was right in the middle of that arc. And I can remember having numerous discussions with some of your council people at the time because they're very concerned about it. why is Eugenia Avenue sort of this hot spot for erosion and turf point. And if it weren't for the monitoring that had been done, you know, that we had a chance to do, we wouldn't have been able to identify that signature. But you, you may want to look at it every two years. I think every five years is a little bit too infrequent given the dynamics of 
to the East End. But you know, that's something that I think you all have to have to decide. No, I have no, I this for your for your stuff. Your thoughts on it. I can tell you that our claim to fame and, and the secret of our success from one end of this coast to another has been the opportunities to monitor on a regular basis. Um, at Myrtle Beach, whether it's Myrtle Beach or Edisto Beach, Hunting Island, and each of these sites is different. And by monitoring every year, you develop the quantitative data about the sand budget for your island. It's, it's your key resource. And it also allows us to see how the sand is moving around. And it is different from, from site to site. So you know, try to answer questions like this gentleman's about the, why is that little uh, freshwater pond breaching or not breaching? Well, I can tell you from some examples of other coast, but we've been here for an hour. I don't want to go into a lot of detail about that. Yes, it's a burning question. Yeah. Um, why is there so much flip side difference between Edisto, Fred, and Hunting Island, and the other just in particular Hunting Island with massive loss? Well, what, why isn't all the sand that's moving down moving down that way too? Well, it's not just a river of sand, it just comes north to south. And in the case of Honey Island and Harbor Island and Frith, that sand is tending to move into St. Helena Sound. So if you're on Honey Island, sand is actually moving to the north. It's flipping across Johnson Creek Inlet onto Harbor Island Creek, and it's getting bottled up in there and trying to go into St. Helena Sound. Frith Island is gaining some sand that's coming off of Honey Island but it too has sand that wants to go north. It's just the channel is preventing it from going around the corner there. So it's a different dynamic. You actually have northerly transport dominant on those two islands. So St. Helens Sound will fill up? And well, St. Helens Sound is trying to fill up, but it's got so much capacity. St. Helens Sound is, yeah. is just humongous. So there's all this capacity in there to capture sand. Is there yeah, any other relatively new phenomenon? Because it has been going on for thousands of years. Sure, it's been going on right now. And then the other thing that's interesting about this, you know, I wanted to hold up this image here. You might see on the back side of this little handout, we have the 1860 shoreline, the 1989 shoreline, and today's shoreline. One of the first things that I learned when I got to graduate school is that the coast as we know it exists as a balance between the rate of sediment supply and the rate of sea level rise. So if sea level is rising, but we don't provide any new sediment, the shoreline is going to recede. Okay. If we provide lots of sediment, despite sea level rise, we have this situation that you have. And it turns out sea level rise is just one minus minuscule factor in shoreline change in South Carolina. Sea, sea level rise only accounts for about 10 feet of movement in our state for the last 30 years. So you can pretty much ignore it. What's important is this process right here for you. Show by Show by that's the, that's the buzzword of the day. So, so we got a couple more questions. <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess going back to your question is, um, I would have not been that concerned about what's going on on the far end of the island, but from what I've seen in the last eight months, that's why I'm here. I never come to these meetings, but I'm concerned because I've seen that move 150 yards in six months. It was, and it looks to me like it's trying to go back to where it was. Well, actually, after um, 2007, I showed you that it moved, and over the next two years, it migrated to <coughs> actually um, over uh, that distance of probably about 600 feet. It actually moved closer to the bike and then relocated itself again back to the north, whole inlet. Moved to the east. Yeah, it moved to the east. Yeah, it's, it's moved down, and it's also um, filling in the uh, lagoon. The lagoon in the last, the west lagoon in the last eight months has probably gotten 
uh, twice as shallow because it's taking all that sand off of that area that you showed that was that was now built up. It's eating away and pushing it. It's put. It's amazing to me. It's moved 150 yards um, from the ocean side all the way out to the lagoon. It's literally pushed it all up in there. And now with the new inlet in there, it's, it's pushing sand even faster. And it looks to me like it's going up the lagoon. That in eight months the lagoon's going to be not going to be there. Because it's going to be filled up with sand. The, na the natural, and what we see in most places, like our palms, are the size of these events create a small lagoon, but it's not big enough to maintain itself. And the beach just washes over, fills it, and then you're back with the same shoreline you had. It's just a little bit more sand. Over at the East Lagoon, there was so much sand that it was enough to build that extra barrier island that we mentioned. So it built up. Not just a berm of sand, but dunes, vegetated dunes, trapped in marsh, and now it's stable. So you have that maintained lagoon. If, if we're given, say we just stopped the flow of sand now, yes, it's going to erode, merge back into the beach, those dunes will erode, it'll start overtopping itself and pushing back on shore uh, to where we end up back where we were in 1989. Is that to me that from that east lagoon or all the way to the tip of where that? Piping flow of refuge is. It looks to me like it's, it's trying to go back to the way it was. And that's my big concern is that it just found all this money and made all this stuff. And now it looks like it's retreating back to what I saw almost uh, 15, 15 years ago. I, uh, I'm seeing the same thing. I'm seeing rapid moving of sand. I doubt it will do that because the reason it moved to the center of that west lagoon is it was a more efficient flushing area. <coughs> but as it becomes filled with marsh and there's an incised channel, it, there's not really a hydraulic force to keep back up. moving it down to the west. So I don't, I don't think the ocean of course is any immediate danger. So, um, At one time we had a channel on the back side there too, uh, going up to Stone Oak. That closed off now? Yes. Okay. That closed off fairly early. It was, yeah. uh, 2000 more days, something like that. Because I remember there was there was actually a proposal at one point to make a connection. You don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was how we talked about building the dice there and closing that off. You know, and uh, yeah. the, the OCRM that would allow sandbags and doing it with just sand was hopeless. You know, so they wouldn't allow that design. You know, I, I think if, if you bear with it, I, I do want to ask. Jim, if he would speak about the habitat uh, from his perspective, because he's been watching it real closely for a few guys. Has it succeeded? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a very dynamic area out there, um, and, you know, it, it changes every day, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, the habitat for, for shorebirds, fish, I mean, everything, it, it's all still there. It's Yeah, no, probably a lot. I mean, it's, I mean, literally, yeah. I mean, weeks go by and it's completely different. I can go over to feeding in a different spot. You know, I mean, it's, uh, if somebody had asked me, how long does it take a barrier island to form? 30 years ago when I was in graduate school, I would have said, well, you know, probably a century, a couple of centuries, years, something right? like that. You all know, are among the first to see how quickly the barrier island can form. You throw enough sand in the system, the habitats, everything will evolve exceedingly rapidly. So the next time somebody talks, talks to you about the, the <coughs> fragile nature of the barrier islands, you can create all these habitats if you put enough sand in the system very quickly. Nature will redistribute it, create the humans, create the marsh habitats. In fact, Marsh is one of the toughest species known to mankind. You can't get rid of it. What is the secret to marsh? Getting the substrate elevation right at mean high water. If you put it there, you can't keep the marsh out. If you put more sand on top of that substrate, you're going to kill the marsh. If you dig it too deep, 
You'll flood too much, you're going to kill the marsh. But as long as that substrate is bingo, right at being high water, the locality, you can't get rid of that stuff. It's hardy, hardy buck grass. So keep that in mind next time you take a look at all the fragile marsh out there. An, an interesting uh, uh, situation, not situation, but conversation. I think Jim was there three or four years back when we were looking at a, a 30 spot parking lot out on the beach down on the, on the East End. <coughs> And we had the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, Melissa Bindi, out there. And uh, she said, no, you can't. you can't. Even though it's a, a coquille shell, you, you can't do anything out there. I said, you know, when we wanted to do the uh, repair and nourishment of the East End, you were against that. Now, look at look at what we have, all of the, uh, with the birds, the, the piping clovers, the, you, you name it. Uh, that, that we've created this, this, this additional wildlife reserve. She just smiled, and, and we never did get our parking lot. Don't <laughs> be against it. Uh, <laughs> our parking lot was underwater. Where it was plotted, it was underwater. No, not at, at that time. It was not underwater. That, that was that was after the renovation. Oh, yeah. By, by a couple of years, and uh, what we ended up doing is putting the parking lot over the. Uh, well, oh, of course, well, you know, you know, Charlie, the, the difference between buildable land on Kiowa and, and salt marsh is about this much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Steve would like to do some develop, redevelopment <laughs> on the extent of the I don't think that's going to work. But thank you again, everybody. Thank you.